YouTube, what the crap's going on? Heir of Carthage here, and welcome to Total War Warhammer 2. Been waiting a long time for this, and I'm very excited. And let me start by saying thank you to Creative Assembly for providing me with a review copy. Um, Creative Assembly actually got review copies out quite early with this, <clears throat> and it's very much appreciated from people like myself and the others who received it because it gives us time to familiarize ourselves with the game before release. What am I here to talk to you today about? Because there's a lot of things to cover in a new game. I think the first thing that I want to talk to you about is a cool campaign that you may have seen earlier today in a stream done by Total War. They stream some Techless High Elves campaign. Now Techless, if we go in here to a new I campaign, is right here. So Lore he's the leader of the Order of Lore Masters faction, which is a High Elves race. And uh, Teclas is an interesting kind of combination between Spellcaster and Melee Hero. Um, so he is a really cool guy, but his, if you look at the starting difficulty, um, like, so for instance, this is just the regular slider here, but uh, it tells you initial challenge is hard for Teclas, whereas it's normal, I would dare say easy, um, for his brother Tyrion, because Tyrion starts on the High Elf Fortress of Ulthwan. Um, whereas Teclas starts in the far southern reaches of the map and has no immediate help, facing immediately up against uh, lizardmen and other enemies. So it makes it pretty interesting, and I wanted to give you a few tips and show you a few things. Now, if you watch this, I won't be showing any spoilers such as cutscenes or anything like that, so that you can have that for yourself, but I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the Teclas campaign and how you can get your Teclas campaign started the right way, so let's jump in. So in the very first turn of a Teclas campaign, this is where you're going to find yourself. Let me show you your overall location. Uh, so you are in the far southern areas of Lustria, starting on the Turtle Isles. Um, so it's a pretty cool start position. Um, if you look at the overall map, just to give you some perspective, Tyrion starts up here in Ulthwan. The Dark Elves start here mainly in Nagarond and Lizardmen have a presence kind of all over throughout Lustria. Um, and then, of course, there's other factions over here in, uh, I don't know exactly what they call this entire continent. Is it Araby or something like that? I don't I don't know. But in any case, uh, yeah, you can see your position in the world very, very far to the south, almost to the southern tip of Lustria. Now, there are some High Elves relatively close by um, here at the uh, Citadel of Dusk, um, but if you look, otherwise, there's some desert here, which is foreboding. Um, and then there's mountains nearby which contain both dwarves and possibly even some skaven, if such things exist, which you don't have to believe those rumors, by the way. Um, and yeah, you're going to find yourself immediately up against some interesting foes. Um, this Chamber of Visions, for instance. Oh, it's, there, is there it is. It's held by some a sub-faction of Dark Elves, so immediately you're going to find yourselves having to tangle with some dark elves. So, how do um, the the elves play? Yeah, okay. Shut up. All right, so how... <laughs> Cram it! I'm trying to talk here. All right, if anybody lets me get over it. So there was a little thing that popped up at the beginning that says how they play. Well, high elves are really kind of masters of trade. Um, they are quite good at trade. They have a lot of influence, which is a special ability they bring um, to the campaign map. And then um, you use that influence in both diplomatic and recruiting type scenarios. So let me explain it a little bit. This is the influence uh, bar right here, and it tells you when you have gained influence. Now, you can gain influence um, when little dilemmas pop up and uh, from a few other sources. But yeah, so that's how you gain influence. You can use that influence when you go to recruit a lord. So let's say, for instance, we wanted to recruit a new lord. Um, we don't have any influence, so it's not going to make it available. Um, but if you look, um, there's lords that come with better stats, and actually it says it right here, yeah, you can see that this lord would cost you 60 influence, and then they have some that are slightly cheaper at 15, and so on. So basically you can use your influence to purchase better, uh, heroes and lords, or you can use that influence, um, when you do this intrigue at the court. So for instance, if I need Melwyn and the Citadel of Dusk, to be better friends with me, I can use my influence to improve relations, or if you want someone to be angry at you because you want a good reason to attack them, you can decrease that influence. You can choose from the factions right here. So that is how influence works for Teclas. You have to remember that it can be quite useful 
if you need to maybe intrigue another faction into trading with you or giving you help, so you have to make sure to use that influence to your advantage. So choose carefully whenever the dilemmas pop up. Now let's skip ahead a few turns and kind of see how the campaign started to unfold a little bit my first time through it. Now what you're seeing is 30 turns in to the Techless campaign. You can see I've made a small amount of progress. We've finished off capturing the uh, the Turtle Isles, and we've taken control of the Forbidden Jungle, and I even took, uh, or I'm about to take, a settlement down here from a, a Lizardmen sub-faction uh, in the desert. Now a couple things that, uh, to point out here, um, this particular uh, settlement here has this re ritual resource site. Each faction is racing to get to the Great Vortex at Ulth 1. They each have to do their best to take control of it. Here it is. And you can actually see this arms race right here. And uh, you have to gain enough ritual currency, which in the case of the High Elves is way fragments. Um, so you gather these way fragments either through completing missions or from buildings. And you can see right now I'm obtaining five per turn. Well, Nagarond here is slightly ahead of me in the arms race, and they are working towards their first ritual. So it says they're progressing towards the ritual of the tortured oracle. If the factions beat you to this final ritual, they have the opportunity to defeat you without having to take all your lands away. So turtling up and hoping for the best won't necessarily be to your best interest in Warhammer 2. So in this case, you can see I am slightly behind. I'm losing the arms race to Clan Moors, um, to Hexwatl, um, which is the Lizardman. I probably said that wrong, but that's okay. And then also Nagaron. Um, a couple other things to explain real quick that are kind of cool in the campaign. You can see this green circle by a settlement, and you'll notice that over here at the Golden Colossus, it's a red circle. This has been explained before, but this, this is kind of the way that settling works in Warhammer 2. My faction uh, has a certain climate that it likes, and you can see that the Turtle Isles are a suitable climate, whereas the Golden Colossus here in the desert is an uninhabitable climate. So if I were to inhabit the Golden Colossus, you can see the penalties that I suffer from inhabiting it. So it kind of makes you think about where you want to settle and where you don't want to settle, and you kind of have to strategize accordingly. So just that was one thing to point out. So how are things going? Well, in terms of overall power, if we look, I'm at strength rank 12, but I am losing um, the arms race. And you can see that if we go in here, um, Nagarond, for instance, uh, where are they at? I don't have them up on here yet because we haven't encountered them yet. But Nagarond is ahead of me, and this kind of gives you a feel to where I balance in overall. All right, let's skip ahead yet more and see what it looks like. So here we are 47 turns later. You can see that my territory is colored in red here. So I've advanced and I've gained quite a bit of territory, but I've made a couple mistakes and I want to tell you what these mistakes are. So first of all, I got beaten to the Ritual of Prophecy. Well, of course it's different for other factions their ritual is, but they beat me to the first ritual and now they've beaten me to the second ritual. Why are they ahead of me? Why am I losing the race to these rituals and why am I going to be in trouble if I can't do something about it? Well, let me give you a couple of tips. When you're collecting faction cur or uh, ritual currency for your faction, always check your mission quest up here. If I want to earn, look, I get eight way fragments if I establish a trade route with the spine of Sotek dwarves. I get four way fragments for doing uh, the Call of the Wardens mission here to recruit a lord. I get 10 way fragments for capturing Lax, uh, Laxlin, or Flaxlin, yeah, however you say that. I don't have any idea. Um, so in any case, yeah, that's how you can earn. And then also right here where it says Ritual Resource Site, there is a building that I could build here. And I have built it finally, but I took too long to build it. And it hurt me. This gives me an extra 10 way fragments per turn. And if you look out on the map, there are other places. So like right over here. Um, at this particular settlement, which I haven't found yet, uh, there's way fragments. And then if we look around, look, more way fragments appear. So maybe that should have been part of the strategy if you're going to start as techless. How do you secure more of these way fragments early? Um, maybe you need to use your diplomacy to, to make the factions around you allow you military access so that you can march through and take these settlements um, where you get extra way fragments. That would help you start winning the race to the rituals. So that is the first piece of advice I would give you is as um, uh, as techless, you will need to secure your position, but 
to be honest, you can secure your position fairly easy because the archers of the high elves are very, very excellent. So another tip I would give you is get to where you can recruit Lothran's, Lothran's sea guards with shields as soon as possible. It can be done from the war hall here. Lothran's sea guards with shields, as they start to be upgraded and buffed by your lord's stats, will be extremely useful to you in the sense that they can mow down their enemies from range and they have great melee defense uh, because of the shields that they carry. Again, this is just a look. I haven't even finished necessarily all the upgrades, but look at the stats on these Lothran, uh, or sorry, these uh, Lothran Seaguard. Now these guys don't even have shields, mind you, and they still have 54 melee defense, 32 attack, and 31 weapon strength with anti-large, and of course 41 missile damage and 160 range. So Lothran Sea Guards with shields are going to be incredible units. Make very good use of them uh, early in the campaign. Another thing that I would recommend as the High Elves is the Eagle Claw Bolt Thrower. This unit is devastating to large units, but more so even, uh, or say even more so devastating to blobs of infantry. So a very, very handy unit. Highly recommend that you keep this one handy. It gives you long range to help draw people into your Lothran Sea Guard, where you can then slaughter your enemies. And it works out pretty well. So those are the couple of army tips that I would give you. And if you go look at um, Teclis' uh, skill tree, um, this is kind of how I've decided to progress it. I've buffed all my bow infantry, including the Lothran Sea Guard. Um, and then you can see that I'm working on other things here too. So you can see right when I did this Militia Master, Archers and Lothran Sea Guard got more melee attack and defense. So I have buffed those Sea Guard units to make them absurdly strong. So, and then also in the tech tree, I've done the same thing uh, going in to buff Lothran Sea Guard. Here, look, even more melee defense, even more leadership, extra recruitment experience. And then uh, the same thing here, extra armor that you can give them. So keep, that would be one of the suggestions that I would give you is use those Lothran Sea Guard to your advantage. They are extremely good units. Now let's move on to another save point and see how it progresses as I move further into the campaign. We are back on turn 126. My territory has expanded quite a lot. We've taken the Blood Hall and several others and I've moved north. Um, uh, up into this uh, peninsula up here and I have befriended the spine of Sotek dwarves who are doing very good at keeping the Skaven at bay uh, and then the lizards uh, in the area uh, including Hexodal here however you say it um, I've befriended them to where I don't have to worry about fighting them and the reason why I don't want to fight them right now is look at Nagarond Nagarond has pulled way ahead of us in the race to the rituals and they are going to beat us because of how fast they're advancing so what this has done is it's forced me to realize that early on when I made the mistake of not gathering those uh, those wave fragments, that ritual resource, fast enough, it puts me behind the ball bad to Nagaron. And so it's forcing me in a desperate plea. I have gone north and I've started uh, sacking uh, cities from Nagaron in order to slow them down. I've hit this, um, this Sildra Tor and I've taken this mirror peak of Topek because it allowed me to also get even more ritual uh, resource. And now I'm gonna go after Grey Rock Point, Ziggurat of Dawn, uh, Skeggy, and then I'm gonna work my way up here onto the mainland. At the same time, I've been using that influence that you have from a diplomatic standpoint. You'll notice I have great relationships with the other High Elf factions, and we can take, um, we can take this oh, faction like Lothran. Uh, led by Tyrion, and I'm using him, you can see, to help attack Nagaron and put I... pressure on the High Elves. So if we come over here, um, you can see that there's already been some inroads made by Lothran where they are attacking the High El or the Dark Elves for me. So I'm now using that diplomacy that the High Elves are good at, and I'm using it to help influence my uh, allies to attack my enemies, and I'm going to continue to do that. You Defend can see Citadel of Dusk also has an, uh, an attack order on them. So any ally that I make, I'm getting them to help me attack the Dark Elves. Can I and since I have lost the race in terms of ritual resource, I'm now going to have to exert military dominance over the Dark Elves, which can be tricky because if you look, the climate as you come north into Nagarond, not so conducive for High Elves anymore. You can see it's not quite so good. It's not terrible, but as you move further north, I would imagine that that changes. So it's going to make things interesting. So like I said, now I'm in a race. Now, what can I do to stop Nagaron since they're so far ahead of me? Well, I've got to go up and, you know, like I've said here, invade them militarily. So what have I done to better my chances? Well, now we're bringing out the big guns, folks. So I would highly recommend 
you get a hold of some dragons as soon as you can. Dragons are a fantastic unit in Warhammer 2 campaign. They have a breath attack, which is devastating to archers and other lightly armored units, or blobs in general. And they pack some serious weapon strength. You can see this one's 600 weapon strength because of some upgrades. Massive armor piercing damage. And of course, they can terrorize enemy troops. Really good units. They are expensive. So if you do want these guys, focus on trade with your friends. So you can see I now have trades open up with all of my uh, friends here. And I'm focusing Actual too sense. on any time I get access to a new trade resource. I make sure that I'm selling that resource like these dyes. Um, and you can see over here medicinal or well I don't own this but you know like medicinal plants and other things that you can trade uh, when you don't have a ton of trade resources as the high elves you can still build this um, structure here which is this elven fairground it starts here with the elven craftsman and you can sell elven trinkets while earning some income as well so this is one way that you can get some trade going even if you don't have a resource settlement so use that trade to your advantage you can see that my income now is spectacular I have only two armies, one that's basically defending my territories, and then Teclis, which is being more offensive, and I could recruit another, but I'm banking a bunch of money so that if need be, I can send intervention armies against Nagarond while I'm also attacking them in their southerly realms. So now, that's how I'm going to take down Nagaron. So again, the tip here, focus on that income. Get your trade up. Get that income through the roof. In terms of what I like to build in the settlements to make that happen, just give you an idea here your main chain settlements um i i really only kind of like having one main military settlement unless there's a reason to do otherwise otherwise i focus on defense of the settlement so i don't have to leave troops parked everywhere growth public order and trade and then i have one settlement where i've focused on all my military buildings and you can see that even here i put in some trade too but here's all my military recruiting power way back here at Turtle Isle. And again, I provide defenses anywhere where possible. Look at the defenses that I get in even these minor settlements. A Great Eagle, Illyrian Reaver Archers, Silver Helms, White Lions. Um, so even my small settlements have significant defenses, which helps protect them. And here I just keep a second army in the background packed full of Lothran Sea Guard to help slow down anybody who wants to invade my homelands because trust me, it happens. Let's move on to my last save point and see how my progression has come still. Alright, this is the last save point um, that I got to last night. This is turn 139. You can see I'm actually performing a ritual here, uh, which is the ritual of s the scholar. And you can see that the magic tying itself back to the, um, the Great Vortex, it is pretty sweet looking. And when other factions do this, you can see the magic on the map too. I have to defend these settlements against would-be intruders that would come to stop you. As soon as you go into these um, uh, rituals, you'll be attacked by roving bands like these um, Norsicans and like these clanless Skaven. You can see they're riding atop a rat ogre. Um, so yeah, you, you get attacked by chaos uh, as well. So there's all kinds of people who attack you and sometimes your enemies will send intervention armies and come attack you as well. Uh, but at this point, I've used that influence. When you look at the diplomatic status, uh, I'm on good terms with my neighbors nearby, uh, including the lizard men. So no one near me wants to attack me and it gives me this great buffer when I go into a ritual. I leave one army behind to help protect. I've now made a third army, which is headed north to come attack the west area of the High Elves territory so that I can put as much pressure on the High Elves as possible. You can see I've basically halted their progress through damage and I've pulled ahead of the Lizardmen and Clan Moors. So I'm evening out that arms race to get to the, uh, the ritual, uh, the final ritual. So at this point, uh, my efforts are paying off and although I had a shaky start, the strategy has become clear. Leave an army for defense, expand quickly, make friends of some of your neighbors, and then I still haven't though, this is where I would say you need to do differently, you need to get over here and capture um, these volcanic, this volcanic islands site here, or uh, not the volcanic islands, but whatever the settlement is here, I don't have it listed yet, um, but yeah, you need to come over here and capture the altar of the horned rat, because there's ritual resources there, and then you also need to come over here and take Laxlon. Now, the, the trick to this one, though, is that it's owned by the lizards. But again, use your influence. There's ways that you can do it.
there's ways that you can take it without getting yourself into trouble. So that's the only thing I would do differently is I would take those and it would put me ahead in the arms race. But otherwise, my bid to stop the high elves is working. You can see I've raised Grey Rock Point. I've taken Skeggy and Ziggurat of Dawn. And then my high elf um, allies are moving against Nagarond here. And Nagarond actually begged me for peace for the first time on this turn, which means they are hurting bad and we are going to halt their progress. Um, so you can see my allies are there. I'm headed north to the Moon Shard, and we will defeat these Dark Elves. Dragons were a huge piece of it. Um, so in any case, hope you all enjoyed this. That's a little bit of strategy. If you have any questions about Teclas, I will tell you what I know so far. Very, very fun campaign. It will put you through a challenge because you're going to start away from help. You're going to have to get aggressive early. You're going to have to dig in, get those ritual resources, open those trade routes, Get out and collect these treasures. This is a big mistake right here with this treasure sitting here. I should have already collected it. All you have to do is put some ships to sea and click on it. I collected some of the treasures around me, but not all of them. Go get those treasures. They're worth a lot, and they give you cool items early on in the campaign. So that's another tip that I would give you. And then also, these ruined settlements here, or unexplored settlements, you can send a single lord. So, like, for instance, I could recruit a lord... Um, at one of these settlements so like for instance I could come here and I can just recruit like a standard old lord and I can take this lord and I can walk them down to search these settlements so see right there where it has a little treasure chest thing I can go search that settlement and you can potentially turn up ritual resources as well so search empty settlements um, collect the treasure chest uh, or like these treasures you see out to sea um, capture every point that has this ritual resource and then as the high elves use that influence to better the diplomacy around you and make sure there's no wars at home so you can go project your power abroad against those factions who are ahead of you. So those are the strategies I would give you. I hope you all enjoyed it. Appreciate Creative Assembly letting me get this to you. Again, let me know if you have any questions. Heir of Carthage signing out, and I will see you soon on my first playthrough video of the Techless campaign.